Good morning. Welcome to today's webinar entitled After Brexit, the Future of Ireland's Relationship with the US and the UK. My name is Patrick Griffin. I'm the director of the Keogh Naughton Institute for Irish Studies at Notre Dame and at the Keogh School of Global Affairs. We're delighted to host this event in association with UK and a Changing Europe. That's a forum for independent research into the complex and ever-changing relationship between the UK and the European Union. Panelist Anand Menon is director of UK in a Changing Europe. Thank you, Anand, for partnering with us today. The purpose of this discussion is to provide an update on the process of the UK's departure from the EU and the likely effects facing Ireland in the years ahead. We will also consider how the new Biden administration will navigate this post-Brexit reality. Earlier in the year, COVID-19 catapulted the world into a state of anxiety. And at times, it was tempting to forget that a whole range of major issues such as Brexit were yet to be resolved. I'm reminded of Winston Churchill on the Ireland situation in 1922 in the wake of another event that caused great anxiety, the Great War. As he put it, the modes of thoughts of men, the whole outlook on affairs, the grouping of parties, all have encountered violent and tremendous changes in the deluge of the world. But as the deluge subsides, and the waters fall short, we see the dreary steeples of Fermanagh and Tyrone emerging once again. With vaccines on the horizon, beginning by the way with a county Fermanagh woman in Coventry in England, and our own particular deluge subsiding, we return our focus to Brexit and talk of Fermanagh and Tyrone. So let me introduce our panel of experts. First, in addition to being a director of UK and a changing Europe, Anand Manon is professor of European politics and foreign affairs at King's College London. He has written widely on many aspects of EU politics and policy and on UK EU relations. He is associate fellow of Chatham House and senior associate member of Nuffield College in Oxford. Anand joins us from England. From Belfast, we have Katie Hayward. Katie is Professor of Political Sociology at Queen's University, Belfast. She is author of numerous publications on lots of the questions we're going to be discussing today, including most recently the report Bordering on Brexit, Views from Local Communities in the Central Border Region of Ireland, Northern Ireland. From Abu Dhabi, we're pleased to have Kevin O'Rourke. Kevin is Professor of Economics at NYU Abu Dhabi. He was previously Professor of Economic History at Oxford. Kevin's research lies at the intersection of economic history and international economics, and he has published extensively on the history of globalization and deglobalization. His most recent book is A Short History of Brexit from Brentree to Backstop. And finally, joining us from Washington, D.C. is Heather Connolly. Heather is Senior Vice President for Europe, Eurasia, and the Arctic, and Director of the Europe Program at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Prior to joining CSIS, Heather served as Deputy Assistant Secretary of State in the Bureau of European and Eurasian Affairs. There she had the responsibility for US bilateral relations with the countries of Northern and Central Europe. So welcome to all of our guests and thanks for all of our panelists for taking the time to join us today, especially given the fact that the UK and EU are yet an, at yet another crucial point in negotiations as we approach a deadline for, the, for a deal. Things are moving quickly. Maybe they're moving to resolution or maybe this is Groundhog Day. I'd like to start first with Anand. Here's my question. The UK left the European Union on 31st January this year, marking the beginning of a transition phase, which is due to end on the 31st of December. We're still waiting to hear if a deal between the two parties has been reached. Could you give a brief overview of how we got to this juncture from the original referendum in June 2016, Anant? Well, how long have you got? Uh, it's, I mean, it's, it's been a remarkable four years uh, that has seen the British political system come under unprecedented strain. Essentially, where we are now is the culmination of the fact that the, those in the Conservative Party who wanted the most extreme sort of Brexit basically saw off all opposition one way or another and managed finally to crown one of their own, Boris Johnson, as Prime Minister uh, last year. 
So we're, the position we're in now is a curious one. We're in a position with a choice between either a no deal Brexit, so there is no agreement reached with the European Union, or a deal with the European Union that is so thin that it covers only a small proportion of the areas where we have cooperated as a member state. Uh, one of the most remarkable things in government messaging over the last few weeks has been this sort of desperation to stress to businesses who are preparing for this change that virtually all of the preparations they would need to make for no deal Brexit, they're gonna to have to make for Brexit with the kind of deal we look like getting. Uh, having said we look like getting, I realize I misspoke because at the moment I'm very, very pessimistic as to whether or not a deal is going to be struck. Uh, I don't think, you know, there's been a lot of coverage and I'm sure others will talk more knowledgeably than me about this, about what the joint committee uh, agreed today and that is a really big deal as far as uh, Ireland is concerned but I don't think it moves things one iota as far as the Brexit negotiations themselves are concerned I mean in some ways actually there might be those in government who thinks it provides a floor for a no deal Brexit which I suppose it does if you're being utterly cynical that was as brief as I could be well, that was great but why is that why are you so pessimistic because I think the differences are differences of principle and the differences of principle that are grounded in politics, which is almost the worst combination for any negotiation. Uh, the principle on the British side is the point of leaving the European Union was so that they could no longer tell us what rules we had to abide by. The principle from the EU side is if you want a tariff and quota free deal, you've got to abide by some rules. So just on the surface of those two statements, you can see where the difference of principle comes from. You can add to that politics. President Macron has got to go home with a win and with a deal that looks workable and one that provides for fishermen amongst others. Boris Johnson's got to come home and placate those in his parliamentary party who are really anti signing up to any commitments to the European Union. His job's made more complicated, I think, by the fact that there is a remarkable overlap between the people who want the hardest form of Brexit and the people who are very unhappy with his lockdown policies. So it might be that the Prime Minister thinks, actually, do I want to pick another fight with these same people? So the politics is very, very finely balanced. So whilst I can see a way through to getting a deal, just over the last 24 hours, I think I've become more pessimistic than I've been about the prospects of there being one. But I've been wrong on every single call for the last four years, so don't get too depressed about this. Good. So I'll put my money down on that one. <laughs> Thanks. Very that, wise. That tip. Okay, let's talk about COVID-19. How has it affected the negotiations between the UK and the EU and also perceptions of EU solidarity, or has it? Uh, it's affected negotiations in some very direct ways. I mean, both chief negotiators got it, so the negotiations were paused. But I think in a more more subtle yet more fundamental way, what COVID has done is it's distracted attention. I mean, what we're finding now is that ultimately, there's no point Michel Barnier and David Frost being in a room together because they are not in a position to make the compromises necessary to get a deal. Uh, one of the things that has happened this year is that quite rightly, heads of state and government have been distracted by COVID and simply haven't given the attention to Brexit that they otherwise might have done. I think it would be we might be in a different position now had it not been for COVID because I think leaders would have given more attention to this and we might have unlocked a compromise uh, earlier on. So that's, that's the fundamental difference. There's also, I think, in, in government, a sense that I'm starting to think is real, even though it's wrong, that given the scale of the COVID crisis, Brexit is less of a big deal. Uh, as I said, I think that's fundamentally wrong in virtually every respect. I mean, the most simple respect in which it's wrong is that the most credible modelling suggests that even with a deal, Brexit will be more damaging to the British economy over the next 10 years than COVID will be. So Brexit is a bigger deal economically. But I just think that politicians are very caught up in the immediate. And it's very interesting talking to people in government about how little attention they've given to this over the last few months. It's only in the last couple of weeks that government has switched its gaze back to Brexit, which is remarkable given the stakes. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you, Anand. Kevin, if I can turn to you. Kevin, the EU and the UK, they've been in negotiations, these talks on and off for some time. What are the sticking points? And how would you evaluate the level of trust between the parties around the table today? Yeah, I think, I think Anand already identified what the, the major sticking point is. It's this question about um, what the Europeans call uh, 
a level playing field. Um, and, and I think Ananda is also right. I, I think that these are our are, are differences of philosophy. And I think that if we don't get a deal because of these differences about level playing fields and, and common rules, it won't be a failure of negotiation. You know, negotiation cannot, by definition, bridge an unbridgeable gulf of principle. Uh, in, in the case of the EU, this concern about quote unquote fair competition goes right back to the Treaty of Rome. I mean, the Treaty of Rome doesn't just abolish tariffs and quotas. There's stuff in there about equal pay for men and women. You know, I, I think we can probably assume that this wasn't because the Christian Democrats of the 1950s that were drafting these treaties were feminists. I think it was because there was already equal pay for men and women in France, and they didn't want uh, the Germans to steal a competitive march on them by not paying uh, uh, women equally. There's, there's stuff in there about paid vacations, about overtime. There's, there's all sorts of stuff in there that reflects a really deeply seated fear of uh, a regulatory race to the bottom. And, and this is something that um, the great uh, British historian Alan Millward talks a lot about in, in his book. He says, look, you know, after the catastrophe of the 1930s, you know, two things are clear. Firstly, you don't want protectionism across the continent of Europe. So you want, you know, a, a market that is as, as unified and as strong as possible across these small fragmented bond out countries. But you also want states to protect workers because they hadn't in the 30s and we know how that uh, ended up. So, so those things go together and it's deeply embedded in, in the EU uh, DNA. And I would say that COVID in a way, which is a, a great accelerator of trends that were already present, you know, is is further heightening, uh, you know, fears about unregulated markets, about you know supply chains stretching into Asia and all the rest of it. It's giving the French, you know, new ammunition, if you like, and so, uh, you know, it 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 it's made these concerns about level playing fields even more salient. But but look, the, the but equally on the other side, as Alan says, the whole point of Brexit was was to to take back control and. I mean, I don't know if your listeners are familiar with Danny Roderick's tri political trilemma of globalization. I mean, that's one way of thinking about what, what Brexit uh, involves. You know, uh, getting rid of tariffs and quotas doesn't get rid of border controls because if you have different regulations about what can be legally bought and sold, then you need border controls to make sure the illegal stuff doesn't come in. And so the Europeans, uh, under Mrs. Thatcher's prompting indeed, uh, decided to get rid of the border controls by unifying the regulation. But that does mean, as Roderick points out, that then, you know, a local national parliament cannot decide for itself. And that was always the principled argument for Brexit. And, and there is a principled argument for Brexit. That's it, in my view. Uh, you know, and, and concerns about democratic deficits and so on. I mean, they can be overblown, but they're, they can't be swept aside. There, there are such uh, concerns out there. And so I think it's a really tough sell on both sides, you know, to give the other side the sort of deal that they would be comfortable with. Uh, so, so that's where we are. I mean, fish is a different matter entirely. Fish is the sort of thing that diplomats love because that's all about numbers. You know, it's about percentages. You know, you say you want 20, we want 80, then you can see where there's a landing point, you know, and you can be creative and so on. But when it, it's a binary issue, like do you have common rules or not? That's, that's very, very uh, uh, difficult indeed. Um, you mentioned trust. I mean, that was a real problem uh, with this internal market bill. But I mean, the great news of tonight that I, I suppose Katie will talk about, and she's the one who knows all about this, is that that issue has been uh, taken off the table. I think that has lots of ramifications, actually. I think that has ramifications for UK-US relationships, pretty obviously. Uh, I think it has also ramifications for UK-EU uh, relationships. Um, I thought Anand was was absolutely right when he says this may be a bottom line. I mean, I I might I would say it maybe ma makes it possible to envisage a friendly no deal Brexit, you know, because the, the 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 fear the fear was that we'd have no deal and then the British would renege on the withdrawal agreement and then the Europeans would retaliate and we'd be sucked into a really negative spiral and we wouldn't be talking to each other uh, and and hopefully you know if this most sensitive issue now has been dealt with then there's no reason why you couldn't then if there is a no deal start to talk about you know little side uh, arrangements here and there that can make life better and and we can still keep talking and then and then we'll see where we uh, end up now whether whether the fact that no deal brexit has become less scary makes it more likely uh, 
is 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 another interesting point, and I have no view on that. But you could imagine somebody arguing that actually. Okay, so Kevin, I mean, Anand's already told me to sell short on kind of a deal being done. Uh, what are your views about that? Are you as pessimistic as he is about actually a deal being done? So let's take your crystal ball out and see what you have to say. I, I, yeah, I, I have no idea. I have no idea what's going to happen, actually. I think, I mean, logic, the logic of it seems to argue in favor of no deal to me, you know, uh, if you think the political principle is what matters and ideas are what matter in politics. If you think that naked economic interest uh, is what really matters, then that might lead you to go for a deal. But what we know about Brexit, it's not about naked economic interest, it's about, it's about principles. And I suppose the, the, the final thing I would say is, I mean, okay, so I'm sounding now more sanguine about an, an ideal Brexit because I, I, I think the, the worst of all outcomes, which is a really nasty uh, a confrontation over Northern Ireland is, has probably been averted, but it still will be very costly. It'd be costly for Britain, it'd be bloody costly for Ireland. Also, actually, we'll have agricultural uh, 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 people who will have a hard time selling into the British market. There'll be a lot of, of disruption and uh, it, it will be very costly, you know, which is why the Irish government, I think, has been urging all sides to compromise so much, but, but they may not succeed this time. Well, thanks, Kevin. Katie, but speaking of Ireland, let's turn our attention to you. So there's been a lot of focus on the Northern Ireland Protocol. Uh, can you give us a brief, brief background on the protocol and describe how Northern Ireland will be affected by Brexit? Yeah, thanks, Patrick, and hello, everybody. It's a pleasure to be on a panel with um, people I respect so much. So, yeah, um, so when uh, we had the results of the Brexit referendum, it became quite obvious quite quickly that the position of the land was very vulnerable. Um, and it was, um, you know, understated. Was, the, the point was made by um, Ed Kenny, the Taoiseach at the time, um, whom I uh, was privileged to be on a panel with in Notre Dame about a year ago. Um, he mentioned on the very next day um, a possibility of having a, a board call. Um, and about the land being to be that way. So immediately became um, politically you, quite Excuse me for a moment, you're breaking up. Could you maybe turn off your video and see if that helps? All right. Yeah. Um, so just to get, so right from the beginning, it was quite clear that uh, Brexit was going to be for Northern Ireland. Um, early on after the negotiations began in 2017, uh, the UK and the EU agreed certain things in relation to Northern Ireland, and that was that they had to withdraw in such a way that um, respect unique circumstances on the island of Ireland, uh, avoid a border on the island of Ireland, and also protect the Good Friday the first agreement in all its parts. Um, there was a lot of back and forth, a lot of um, uh, significant statements that were made, uh, some of which um, some potential um, arrangements were um, rejected by the House of Commons and it actually we came up um, in around August last year with the withdrawal agreement, sorry, October last year with the withdrawal agreement had British call on Northern Ireland and Ireland that basically gave Northern Ireland a very specific position. Um, so and this is a distinct position that puts Northern Ireland effectively in the single market and customs union for goods. Um, and that it also contains several important points that are meant to reassure people in Northern Ireland who are very unnerved by the prospect of Brexit. So that is the commitment to no diminution of rights, equality or safeguards as laid out in the Good Friday Belfast Agreement. This is a really important point. Also, that North-South cooperation on the island of Ireland would continue to be maintained, and it mentions several areas in relation to this, although it gives no details, but this is everything from broadcasting to, to healthcare to agri-food. Um, it also um, uh, added this new dimension, which is that um, in four years' time, there'll be a, a so-called democratic consent vote in Northern Ireland by members of the Legislative Assembly in Northern Ireland, the MLAs, who will decide whether those special arrangements for Northern Ireland that keeps it de facto in the Single Market and Customs Union will continue to apply. Um, if there's a vote for that not to happen, so for those articles to be disapplied, then it's up to the UK you to find another arrangement uh, affecting Northern Ireland that will avoid that hard border. 
Well, thanks for that, Katie. I mean, a lot of your research is focused, of course, on the border between Northern Ireland and the Republic. And can you tell us something about the how the Good Friday Agreement, how it's or Belfast Agreement, has it been threatened by ongoing developments? And what now is the state of the border as we speak? Yeah, I'll just I'll try my video again just in yeah, case. Yeah, go for it. If it does work. Um. So yeah, things are feeling a little bit fragile with regards to the Good Friday Belfast Agreement. I mean, essentially, the three strands of the agreement did feel under pressure by the prospect of Brexit, and that is that fundamentally we have the British-Irish relationship that underpins that agreement, and this relationship was very much forged and, forged and fostered through the common membership of the European Union in practical ways as well as symbolically. Um, so there is concern about the fact that the, that the UK and Ireland are on different trajectories now, that those forums in which they meet regularly won't be there. Um, so there's concern about that British-Irish relationship. And we've seen even in most recent um, you know, good developments in the peace process, such as the New Decade, New Approach document at the beginning of this year, that that was very much because of that close British-Irish relationship. So there are concerns about that. There's concern about North-South relationships too, um, partly because of course, um, regardless of the protocol, Northern Ireland is now outside of the European Union. And there will be challenges to North-South cooperation, especially if there's a no deal between the UK and the EU. Um, and then more broadly, um, apologies for the background noise, then more broadly we have um, this fundamental sense of insecurity that is held by both nationalists and unionists. Um, Brexit, even before we had COVID, Brexit itself is very disruptive to the arrangements here in Northern Ireland. It places an awful lot of pressure on the power sharing assembly and executive, um, which struggles to function well at the best of times. Um, and there is a real sense of um, a sort of a ready blame game for the vast majority of nationalists were Remainers. So for Remainers to blame the UK for the very fact of Brexit being taken outside of the EU and for Unionists to blame Remainers and Nationalists for the protocol, which um, was a compromise and which does leave Northern Ireland in a very distinct position, which is very uncomfortable for Unionists. And there are grave concerns about the long term effects of the protocol, both with regards to the Irish sea border, so called, you know, Northern Ireland's relationship with Britain and also Northern Ireland's relationship with the South. One more quick question. Uh, news today, does this change how we're thinking about the border? What does today's news do for the protocol? So, uh, so the withdrawal agreement was all signed off and ratified in January. And in, this, in the last 11 months, we've had the transition period to um, uh, during which there was meant to be discussions between the UK and the EU about how to implement this protocol. So. I heard some um, a respected uh, legal expert the other day describe um, the protocol as a, a masterpiece of mishmash, which I thought was quite um, ominous given, you know, a Northern Ireland quite used to constructive ambiguity. Um, but anyway, there was a lot of, a lot of decisions still to be made about what this meant in practice. Um, and we knew that there was a lot of disagreement, particularly um, political disagreement about what the protocol would mean, how, quite how much it would affect Northern Ireland in very practical terms. Um, and uh, there was a lot of posturing around that. Uh, today we've had news that politically anyway, we haven't had this formally approved um, by the, the EU member states, etc. cetera, uh, but that politically uh, there is agreement on all the outstanding issues in relation to the protocol, um, which basically uh, gives the green light to um, therefore release a lot of information, hopefully in the coming weeks that will enable Northern Ireland businesses and, and um, obviously public departments, et cetera, to, to make the necessary changes to try and uh, ensure that come the 1st of January there'll be as little disruption as possible. Great, thanks, thanks Katie. Heather, let's uh, go to the other side of the ocean for a moment. Um, um, so how is, in your mind anyway, how has the U.S. been engaging with issues around Brexit? Well, uh, thank you so much, Patrick. It's, it's great to be here. You know, unfortunately, the U.S. really hasn't engaged in these issues. So that's a short answer uh, to your question. Well, thank you, Heather, very much. It's been <laughs> 
Um, you know, and in some ways, this is, I, I think, a, a failure uh, for the U.S. to understand how important and strategic it is for this relationship once the referendum occurred to get it right, because the United States needs a strong UK, we need a strong EU to come out of this. Uh, yeah, yeah, unfortunately, the referendum was viewed in many ways, certainly by then candidate Donald Trump as a harbinger uh, of his own election and his, you know, his kindred spirit in Nigel Farage, who formerly led the UK Independence Party, uh, that this was something, again, to be celebrated, to support uh, those who were very fervently in support of, of the UK's departure from the European Union. So they haven't the U.S. hasn't played that role, even as a very quiet, helpful behind the scenes role, to make sure both sides understood if they could. And, and I, I do share the pessimism. The sides are too far apart. Uh, the principled approach here can't be bridged, but at least we could have tried. Uh, but the U.S. has not played its role as a European power for quite some time to be able to manage these challenges. And in fact, if anything, the Trump administration came on side uh, for, for Brexit. And then at the same time, really pressured the UK on a future trade agreement with the United States to move towards US positions across the board, whether that was on agriculture, which all that did in some ways was aggravate uh, the UK's position or has it saw its position as both part of Europe, but separate from the European Union, but also wanting to strengthen its Atlantic uh, relations. So short answer is not much, uh, but I think that's about to change. And let's turn our attention to that. As we turn the page right now, how would you think that a Biden administration is going to approach these different sets of relations that we've been talking about? So US, UK, US, Ireland, US, Europe. So as I like to describe it, the incoming Biden administration, it's, it's going to be simply a sea change uh, from the Trump administration. The question mark is, quite frankly, uh, how much focus and bandwidth uh, that a Biden administration is going to be able to devote to these issues. And I think we, we come at this understanding how devastating the pandemic has been to the United States from a health perspective, uh, an economic perspective, and just the deep depolarization that we're seeing in Washington, sort of, but, but with that caveat, um, you're going to see I would argue the sea change in a in tactical approach to these issues, but a lot of continuity in policy. And I know that sounds very contradictory, but I think that's- Could you, could you expand on that a little bit? What, is, what do you mean by that? Sure, absolutely. So let me, the continuity, the continuity in the US-UK relationship um, is clearly our strong intelligence sharing, our, our security and defense relationship, that uh, our, our interactions at NATO, the security, United Nations Security Council, that's, remains and probably gets stronger in, in a Brexit uh, in environment. Um, the challenge is clearly the economics uh, of that relationship. And I know, you know, we'll talk a little bit about the, the potential future of a US-UK free, free trade agreement. The economics now are thrown into some challenge, but I would argue there's continuity in what makes the relationship strong but the personalities have changed so fundamentally. Uh, and this is where I think for those governments that were seen to be incredibly close to the Trump administration, there's going to be a natural distancing uh, from the Biden administration, but the relationship will remain uh, important. The real sea change is in US-EU relationship. So no longer will a US government view the European Union as a foe and worse than China and an adversarial relationship to the US it is the exact opposite. It is seen as a force multiplier, that the only ability for the United States to meet the global challenges that we see, whether that's China, Russia, Iran, uh, even in globalization, we have to have a strong and united front with our allies in Europe, our allies in the Indo-Pacific. That's how we meet these new, these new challenges. 
uh, again, another big sea change is in U.S.-Irish relations, clearly because of uh, Joe Biden's uh, uh, heritage and, and deep, deep affinity. So Ireland will not have to wait almost three years for a U.S. ambassador to come to Dublin. There won't be a three and a half year wait for the nomination of a special envoy uh, for, for Northern Ireland. You were going to see, uh, again, it's been so clear from, from President-elect Biden uh, that, you know, if someone messes with the Good Friday Agreement, London, I'm looking at you, you are now messing with Joe Biden. And that is a completely different tone and tenor coming from, uh, from Washington. So with that, I think that's uh, the sea change, but there is a lot of continuity. Uh, the USEU relationship, we're gonna run headlong into problems on the digital agenda, digital services taxes, uh, economic competitiveness. We have different views on China and elsewhere. That's the continuity, but the tone and approach and tactics and multilateral, um, you know, choices and tools are going to be so different from the current administration. So one other quick question, Heather, the yeah. way that you're, ca you're characterizing things, would you think that in terms of U.S. relationship to all these various players, it's going to be returned to the way that it was before? Is that what you're thinking? Or are we onto something maybe new? So I would argue if, if the United States thinks it can restore uh, the crockery uh, from, you know, uh, pre-2016, that's not possible. And there will, be, there will be a nostalgic pull to think that somehow we can magically go back to the, to the 1990s. And I see this in transatlantic writings on sort of inspiring, going back to some of the inspirations of sort of the transatlantic charter and things like that. I, I love that era. That era is long, long gone. We have to build a new relationship and partnership for the 21st century that is going to be nimble and agile and economically competitive. Uh, that means we have to strengthen Europe, so that has to be a, a key pillar. But we have to look at, you know, a digital Atlantic concept. We have to think about the West in broader terms than we have. We're, if we fall back into our normal competition and bickering over you know, chlorinated uh, washed chickens and all of that old stuff that's been trapped, we're going to lose. And so we have to put this uh, relationship in a new footing, be much more dynamic and nimble, but, you know, keeping that same spirit of values and, and that as our operating system for the future. Continuity and change, just as you started us out with. I would encourage all of the audience now to please send in your questions if you do have them. Um, and we're going to be getting another round here. Uh, with with our panelists. So you'll see at the bottom of your screen anyway, a Q&A function. Please just tap in a question if you have one. I'd be happy to share them with our, with our panel today. Katie, let me ask you uh, another question. Um, so do recent events in your minds of developments, do they undermine the constitutional future of the UK as we're thinking about the implications for places like Scotland and Northern Ireland? Has all of this made the disintegration of the union more likely? Um, that's a very big question. Yes. I think, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's definitely true that the United Kingdom has fundamentally changed. Um, and, I, I, you know, it's, it's hard to overstate the significance of Brexit um, legally, economically, politically, etc. And um, Arnold and Kevin would be much better qualified than me to talk about that. But I do think internally, I mean, we've got the fundamental fact that obviously Scotland and Northern Ireland voted to remain. Um, and one thing that has been very, you know, possibly surprising through the Brexit process is quite how much it's revealed the lack of familiarity, if you like, of uh, Westminster with the nature of the UK. Um, so even the realities of you know, devolution and, uh, you know, the significance of those, the powers and the responsibilities of the devolved governments um, and how important it is to keep them on board and these huge decisions that are being made. I, I think the sort of the necessities around that have been handled very badly and there, there will be consequences uh, for what, you know, what the UK looks like in the future. I mean, for the time being, I mean, possibly a little you know, simplifying it, but the, the response of the government given all that it's dealing with primarily a kind of simplistic centralizing tendency. So let's just not engage too much. 
um, let's just not ask too much and we'll deal with it in a fairly, you know, fairly blunt, with fairly blunt tools. So managed uh, differentiation within the UK, which has grown up through European integration uh, uh, by sort of putting boundaries to how quite have quite um, how much capacity the various parts of the UK have to, to di uh, diverge. And that's what we see with the UK Internal Market Bill without going into too much detail about it. Um, with regards to Northern Ireland in particular, and I see the question there, and I might as well address it straight up about, you know, it makes you more likely. I mean, I would just say, I mean, the, the, I can happy to talk in much more detail about it, but the, 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 the overriding um, impression of what it is meant for public opinion in Northern Ireland vis-a-vis um, Irish unity is that it just depends on your original view on Irish unification. So nationalists are, uh, this is according to the Northern Ireland Life and Time Survey, we've just seen increasing strong nationalist opinion amongst those who describe themselves as nationalists. They increasingly expect United Ireland and they increasingly want to see it. Um, for unionists, on the other hand, they don't think that Brexit makes much difference at all. They don't think that even if there was an independent Scotland, it would make much difference either to the likelihood of United Ireland or to their desire for it. So um, we always come back to that fundamental point about Northern Ireland is that um, you know, there are very different political aspirations, very difficult, different starting points when it comes to these constitutional questions. And always, always, it requires a very fine balance being able to, you know, to manage these very different views and identities and opinions. Um, hence, the need to take carefully um, whether it's about good agreement, whether it's about the practical. Thank you, Kate. Anand, um, so with the election of Biden, do you think Boris Johnson's style of leadership is going to change at all? And what should we take away from the departure of Dominic Cummings? Uh, no, I don't think so. Particularly. I mean, the, the curious thing about Boris Johnson is, is, is he's a kind of Janus faced prime minister. So domestically, in the way he governs, you can see elements of that sort of populist leader, uh, just in the language he uses, the way he talks about established institutions, the way he portrays himself as on the side of the people against whoever it might be. Uh, and yet internationally, I think over the last couple of years, the UK, certainly over the last 12 months, the UK has defined a course that has been one of supporting the liberal international order, has been one of siding resolutely with the Europeans against Donald Trump when it comes to Russia, when it comes to Iran, when it comes to the Paris Climate Accords. Uh, and so whilst I think on a personal level, there might be a lack of warmth between uh, Joe Biden and Boris Johnson, because Joe Biden's sort of views on Brexit and indeed on Boris Johnson, are there on the record. I think in substantive terms, when it comes to foreign policy, it will be far, far easier for the two countries to work together now than it would have been had Trump won again. And I, I mean, looking forward, I mean, this is a very, very big year for British foreign policy coming up because we take over the chair of the G7, we take over the chair of the Security Council, and we're, of course, co-chairing the COP26 UN uh, Environment Summit in Glasgow. And... On all of those things, uh, we will be able to work quite closely with the United States because our objectives are broadly similar. I think the Biden team have talked in terms that are quite supportive of the British idea of a D10 grouping of democracies. The one, the one part of the foreign policy conundrum I've not touched on uh, is that for all the ambitions that we have over the next year as well, the UK is going to have to find a way of working very closely with the EU states and with the EU as well. Uh, and whilst this government has worked quite closely with the E3, uh, so we work quite well with individual European states, we've contributed to the French mission in Mali recently, for instance, this government has shown a very, very marked allergy for collaboration with the EU as an institution, which poses a question for me, not least when it comes to COP26. You don't have a successful environmental summit without the full buy-in of the EU as an institution. It's not enough simply to work through the member states. So with the US, I'm not particularly worried. With Europe, I think the government might have to adapt its attitude going forward. Let me ask you one other question, a follow-up to something I posed to Katie. Um, do you think that we're going to be seeing a Scottish referendum? No, I don't think there are any circumstances in which Boris Johnson allows the Scots to have a referendum. Uh, then this, that will almost certainly end up in front of the Supreme Court, whether or not the government has the right to block 
another referendum. Uh, we, we, we've seen interesting developments in Scotland. We've seen for the first time, I think, uh, a stable majority in favour of independence in the polling. I think the last 20 odd polls have now shown a majority in favour of independence. But I think the two hurdles are one, whether or not they can get a referendum. And I think even if the SNP, as we expect them to do, gets a majority in May next year, they're going to struggle. The second thing, of course, is a majority in a poll is very different to a majority in a referendum. And I suspect that some of the hardest issues that the SNP will have to address in the event that we have that referendum they don't yet have particularly compelling answers to. And ironically, in the context of this discussion about Brexit and Ireland, the one, I mean, the currency will be one big issue, whether joining the EU means you have to join the Euro, but the other massive issue will be the border. Because of course, given that there's been a, a hard Brexit, which means that actually the customs and regulatory border between uh, the UK and the EU is a relatively hard border, that border would have to be replicated between Scotland and England. Now you hear Scottish nationalists saying, look, I mean, they're curious parodies of some of the Brexit arguments by some of them, we can use technology to deal with the border. I'll let Katie deal with technology because she likes talking about that when it comes to borders. But the second thing you sometimes hear is the EU will make an exception for us in the same way they have about Northern Ireland. And I can't say it strongly enough, no, they will not. And they won't because in Northern Ireland, there were two things that compelled the EU to essentially break some of the principles it said governed its approach to Brexit. First, the EU is a signatory of the Good Friday Agreement. And secondly, the vital national interests of a member state were engaged, i.e. the Republic. Neither of those is gonna be true in the case of Scotland. Great, thanks Anand. Kevin, uh, Anand was just talking about borders and about potential implications for businesses there. And so how do you think businesses are prepared to deal with the consequences of what's going to happen, both uh, businesses in Britain and businesses in Ireland? You don't get the impression that they're as well prepared as they, as they ought to be. I, I suspect it's gonna be a real shock to the system actually. And I think it could be just as much of a shock to the system in Ireland as, as in Britain in some ways. I think we're very used to supply chain stretching into Britain. I think we're very used to sourcing a lot of our consumer goods uh, from Britain. You know, uh, There's been a lot of focus on exports from Ireland uh, into Britain, you know, which might be hurt by tariffs or into Europe, which might be hurt by the kind of congestion on the, the so-called land bridge, which is how we refer to Britain in the context of these discussions. Um, but I think on the import side, it could be just as bad actually. Um, and uh, you know, so 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 the, the the stakes for Ireland are fairly high. We have to try to diversify. We are trying to diversify. There are these new ferry services uh, directly to the continent that I think will help. I think in the long run it might be quite interesting. Um, the consequences. I mean, if you buy a Siemens washing machine or something like this from Germany in Ireland, you know, the chances are you're probably going to buy it through some wholesaler in. Huddersfield or Wolverhampton or, or someplace, you know, and so it'll have been, you know, converted from euros into sterling and then back into euros again. And he probably has had a monopoly on the Irish market that his granddaddy bequeathed him or something. So I think, I think that those kinds of supply relationships may be shook up, but in the long run, it might actually be quite good for us, but uh, it'll be quite problematic along the way. I mean, obviously in Britain, I mean, the, 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 the headline news will concern the car factories and will they stay or will they go? And, you know, we're hearing different things and we'll just have to see. Actually, that's one good thing about our, our coming up to January 1 is uh, we'll no longer have to speculate about what the consequences might or might, might be. We, we will see that it may be painful for some people, but at least it will spare us this never ending. The players are seeing expect long lines. Is that what you're expecting to see? You're expecting to see extraordinary amounts of traffic at the ports? Well, well I mean, like, like Alan said, I mean, the difference between, you know, the deal that there, you know, there, there is invisible and, and, and no deal is, is pretty slim. It's basically about, will tariffs be paid, you know? And I suppose there will probably be some paperwork maybe associated with the payment of a tariff, you know? But I mean, even, you know, uh, you know, even a free trade deal, I and mean, there are going to be lots and lots and lots of customs forms and rules of origin related and, and regulatory forms and so on. And so we know that there's going to be queues like at, at the borders. And uh, in the long run, I suppose those queues will dissipate, but they'll dissipate, I suppose, because fewer lorries will make the crossing, you know, uh, you know, business will adjust and that's how these things work. 
And uh, so in the long run, the costs won't be, you know, the, you know, there will be costs, you know, they, you know, but Britain is a rich country, it will be able to afford to pay them, it just won't be quite as rich as it would otherwise have been. But I think the short run disruption will be quite severe. Yeah. Can I just pipe in on this? Do you mind? Yeah, of course, Anand. Go right ahead. Just, just, to, just to say a couple of things. I mean, I think one of the differences, one of the profound differences between a deal and no deal is that if there's a deal, we probably expect the EU and the French in particular to help us out to make that deal work as seamlessly as possible. Because if there's a deal, remember, it's in the interest of the French to make that deal work as much as because, you know, Macron will have his signature at the bottom of it. So I think... Uh, they will try and help us, but even with a deal, HMRC, which is Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs Service, which is uh, part of the British government, part of the British state, uh, have estimated that the cost of paperwork in the event of a deal for business in the UK will be £15 billion pounds annually. Uh, so, you know, it's very easy to say, oh, they've got to fill in a bit of paper and that's fine. There's an awful lot of paper if you're a company that has got a complex supply chain across the channel, transporting millions of components day after day. The government is estimating, I think, between three and 7,000 lorries snarled uh, in the event of no deal, simply because people have got incorrect paperwork. And on your first question, I just wanted to say, businesses aren't prepared. Uh, Michael Gove was in Parliament about six weeks ago saying the most, he came out with, I can't remember the figure, but some remarkable proportion of businesses were convinced the transition would be extended so they don't need to do anything yet. This was six weeks ago. Uh, and businesses aren't prepared for several reasons. One, they're dealing with a pandemic, which, you know, slightly gets in the way of your business planning. But secondly, they don't know what they're preparing for yet. Uh, you know, it's not clear what this deal will say. We can guess at the outlines of the deal, but they don't know what they're preparing for. And the third thing is, Businesses aren't preparing because this government has insisted on having a sunny, upbeat tone about Brexit. So the emphasis of governing, government messaging has been get ready for the great opportunities of Brexit, which is very much in keeping with the temperament of our prime minister. The government's message should have been, even if we get a Brexit deal, it's going to be a sodding nightmare for you. So you better start preparing now. But of course, that's not the sort of message this government likes to give. So this government, in a sense, has been caught between its ambitions to portray Brexit as a great thing and the reality of the fact that unless businesses understand what's about to hit them, they won't prepare. And as a result, they haven't. Sorry, I just had to get that off my chest. No, please do. Thank you so much. Uh, Heather. Um, well, you, I, want to I want to touch on something that you've already kind of raised, but I'd like you to get into it a little bit more when we think about the Biden administration. And that is, um, when we think about the approach of the administration, how do you think we're going to see uh, multilateralism? Are we going to see more multilateralism? What is going to be the general approach to building allies from the Biden administration? Yeah, this has been very clear uh, that uh, President-elect Biden is really going to have an allied first approach and particularly Europe trying to stabilize uh, those relationships and restore American participation in multilateral institutions like the World Health Organization. I think you'll see a, a re, obviously in the Paris Climate uh, Accord, but also probably the World Trade Organization. But I think, again, this is sort of where we get caught back in the we're not going back to the way it was before 2016, sort of pick up where we left off and, you know, put that last four years of unpleasantness behind us. Too much has happened. So what a Biden administration is going to have to do is rebuild what I call effective multilateralism. And what it's going to look like uh, is a lot of coalition building of the committed that have a unified uh, approach, political will to start, you know, really resolving challenges. We have to sort of, you know, cool it on the summitry and the rhetoric. We've been there, done that. We actually now have to take deep action, difficult action, action on the on, on climate uh, that's, that is going to transform our, our major industries. It's going to be incredibly disruptive. Uh, we're going to have to prepare for a global trading pattern that does challenge China's approach to global trade, but do that again in a unified democratic front. So to be honest with you, the allied first approach has to be about strengthening the West, particularly strengthening the transatlantic relationship so we can go confront these challenges. What we've been doing is you know, describing the challenge but not strengthening ourselves and then to go meet that challenge. So what I worry about is it's gonna look like we are sort of trying to go back to the way it was 
but we're going to have to advance. And again, whether there's political space and bandwidth to do that, a very big question mark. We'll see if the Biden administration can put forward some new ideas and new approaches. If I can follow up then too, uh, Kevin, of course, called, uh, called COVID an accelerant in many ways. Has COVID affected the ways that maybe the Biden administration is going to think about its approach to other nations? So uh, at CSS, we're actually undertaking a major study, uh, sort of a rapid analysis of sort of what the global pandemic has done to the international system. I, I mean, I will say early indications are that you're exactly right. It has merely been an accelerant of pre-existing trends. I would argue the election of President Trump was an accelerant of existing trends in the United States. Uh, it reveals certain things very clearly to us um, that, you know, again, can, can no longer be avoided. Uh, we were already say, seeing a populist push for uh, deglobalization, stronger, you know, borders taking control, more uh, industrial protection strategies. This is happening across certainly the, the West Western world. So, you know, accelerating, yes. And I think very much to Arnon's point about Brexit, and we've written about this, you know, in the summertime, how can you distinguish between COVID and Brexit when you're already turning on the fiscal stimulus tap so everything is being thrown at it? It, it creates that illusion that this is not going to have an impact. But my greater question uh, after uh, the end of this year, beginning of January 1st, who are, the, who, who are the British elite and government going to blame for their circumstances if the EU can no longer be blamed? I think that's why both parties are sitting at that table, not leaving because that blame game uh, doesn't begin. And how do, how do leaders accept responsibility and accountability for lack of preparation, running this thing down to the, to the very end? That's the political dynamics I'm going to look forward to watching as they unfold in 2021. We all will be. Yes, uh, we have lots of great questions now coming in. So let me just ask the panel a few of them. First of all, Kevin, I want to kick off with you. One is a question, of course, that Katie already raised, but then we have another interesting one that would be, I'd love to hear your thoughts on. I want to hear uh, your ideas about a united Ireland. Is that something that is going to happen? That's, that's big question number one, but number two also, and it's probably going to be tied into this too, uh, how do you think Britain's imperial past has informed modern Brexit politics? Okay, yeah, I mean, on Northern Ireland, on, on United Ireland, I'm going to kick that over to Katie because she knows much more about that. Because ultimately, it depends on on internal Northern Irish politics. Yeah. Uh, and I mean, I think she's already addressed that. I mean, so I, you know, I think I think unionism is is, is still alive and well. But I, I, I defer to her on that. On the imperialism thing, well, yes and no. I, I I'm, I'm not so sure at the end of the day. There, you know, there, there's an argument that actually it's the opposite, uh, that, that the, the myth that has sustained a certain sort of Brexit here is the myth of Britain standing alone in 1940, if you want to kind of, you know, uh, reach for these historical cliches, you know, whereas, of course, they weren't standing alone, they were standing with their, their empire. Um, I, I'm, I'm not convinced by it. I think that Fintan O'Toole's book is absolutely hilarious. Uh, it's a great read. But I, 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 I think that... I think in the imagination, I think it's more the mother, the mother being murdered. You know, I think it's Mrs. Thatcher being stabbed in the back by the Europhile ministers in the 1980s that maybe has more emotional resonance for a certain generation of, of Brexit here. You know, they're trying to make it right for, for mummy, you know, um, is what I think. So Freud, as opposed to the imperial. Yeah, party. yeah, Freud, I think, yeah. <laughs> He often is right. Um, Katie, a uh, question for you then. You can address that. You've already touched on that, so we don't need to go into it again, but, but here's a question about um, uh, communities in Northern Ireland. How has Brexit uncertainty affected communities in Northern Ireland? Do you think border regions are acutely affected by this uncertainty, and if so, how? So um, I'm happy to say a little bit more on the United Ireland first. Please. Yeah, we yeah, have to, honest to God, we have like three or four questions on that. So that's the one. Yeah, thing. Okay. Well, we'll just we'll yeah. nail it this time. Yeah. Um, so I just want to pick up. So Anand's points about the Scottish independence referendum are very interesting because there's an interesting contrast with the case in Northern Ireland. So as a result of the Good Friday Belfast Agreement, it is the case that it's the Secretary of State for Northern Ireland. So the UK government minister responsible for Northern Ireland who has to call a referendum 
before we have Irish unity. And he can he or she can call it at their discretion at any point. Or if there's um, if he thinks that there's likely to be a majority voting in such a referendum for a United Ireland, uh, then he's compelled to call it. Um, so then the next question is, well, and what evidence, uh, what evidence would he or she use uh, to make that assessment? And again, Alan's points are interesting there because there's several things that you can consider, whether it's opinion polls um, um, or whether it's sort of long term social attitude surveys. Is it a vote in the Northern Ireland Assembly? Is it first preference votes? Is it the number of seats held in Westminster by nationalist parties or the seats held in the Northern Ireland Assembly? So there are all these different things that they could take into account. But even if you have such a referendum, I think it's worth reminding ourselves, even if there is a yes vote, uh, just quite how um, significant a task it would be. Um, and this is why I'm part of a working group um, in the Constitution Unit and in, in University College London has been working on this question, just about the mechanics around all of this. Just the, the huge um, uh, amount of thought that has to take place before um, a referendum is called or indeed in the in the lead up to the process of unification because you're you're if you think brexit is complicated um oh my goodness it's been really complicated irish unification would be immensely more so because you're dealing with every aspect of state statehood from education policy to healthcare etc so it's just sort of i i am always just keen to emphasize that point it, even in the process itself, you have huge questions and huge issues to address. Um, and then, of course, you have that complexity of the fact that um, even if we have a majority yes vote in Northern Ireland voting for Irish unity, you'd still have that unionist British identity, which Kevin mentions. Sorry, Kevin wants to come in. Kevin, come yeah, on in. Just, can I just say two things? I mean, firstly, uh, if I were unionist, I wouldn't want to give up the National Health Service. Uh, for the absolutely shambolic health service in Northern Ireland. And I mean, that's not just about healthcare, it's about national identity. But the other thing I wanted to say is, you know, people of my generation in the South, we grew up through the troubles. I mean, tea time telly every night was a picture of some body down some laneway in Northern Ireland or some bomb blowing up in a pub or something. So, I mean, the vast majority of us were utterly opposed to political violence and therefore opposed to Sinn Féin and opposed to the uh, IRA. Now, obviously, the Sinn Féin has changed now, and it's ancient history for my kids' generation. And so you wouldn't expect my kids' generation to not vote for Sinn Féin because of their memories of the troubles. That's perfectly reasonable and understandable, and I do get that. But what I find hard to swallow, I must say, is the way in which some younger nationalists are almost glorifying uh, you know, uh, the, the violence of the troubles. You, you, it comes up at uh, GAA matches and things, things that you wouldn't have seen 20, 30 years ago. And of course, the kind of anglophobia that the whole Brexit row of the last four years sparked, I mean, hasn't helped either. So, you know, on the one hand, you know, the, the Republic, you know, loves saying that, well, now we're more, you know, socially liberal and so on. So, so what do the Protestants have to fear from us, forgetting that actually many of the Protestants up there are quite socially conservative. But I mean, on the other hand, I mean, politically, I'm, it's not clear we're as, as warm a house anymore. There's there's a lot of uh, nationalism, I mean, in the negative sense, that's cropped up, I think, since Brexit. Well, this too is complicated because it's happening in the midst of uh, centenary uh, commemorations, things that happened 100 years ago about the creation of these two states. So it's going to be extraordinary to see how these complicated politics and complicated histories play out over the next few years. Um, Heather, we have a question for you. Um, it has to do with a potential free, free trade agreement. Does, uh, how does the manner of the Brexit, as you're seeing it now unfolding, affect the possibility of a US-UK free trade agreement? Well, it's a great question. Uh, quite frankly, in some ways, it's a bit independent of Brexit. And I, I say this because in some ways it's running into some difficult U.S. timelines. So with the change of administration, we have a tool called Trade Promotion Authority or Fast Track Authority, which uh, gives Congress a thumbs up or a thumbs down on a very complex, uh, large free trade agreement. Um, a Biden administration, to meet this timeline, the, the Trade Promotion Authority runs out in June of next year. It's unclear whether it will be renewed. It basically, uh, it wasn't renewed 
previously for about a decade. So it's very controversial. Trade is very controversial. It's the one place where the, the left and the right in our political spectrum meet in some ways to oppose uh, these large free trade agreements. So a Biden administration would have to put forth a, a free trade agreement by April in order for it to be considered by Congress to meet that, that June deadline. Now, um, certainly the Trump administration and uh, now the Johnson uh, administration have been negotiating sort of the, the building blocks of a very comprehensive trade agreement. Uh, but it's run into stumbling blocks, certainly on agriculture. Um, a, a US UK free trade agreement will not go forward without there being some you know, movement of the UK towards US agricultural standards. That's an anathema <laughs> to, uh, to the UK. And in fact, if anything, uh, the UK Trade Secretary Liz Truss has, has been pulled back pretty dramatically. Uh, and, and now Parliament's gonna take a much more involved, it looks like a more involved role in there. So without agriculture, a difficult timeline, and President-elect Biden himself has just recently said he's not interested in any big free trade agreement agreements when he uh, arrives in, in the White House, he is going to focus domestically and rebuilding American industrial capacity. I think that was a signal to the progressives as well as, you know, fighting for a foreign and trade policy for the middle class that he's not going down that road immediately. So quite frankly, I see just from U.S. domestic perspective, it's going to be very difficult to get a free trade agreement. What I do see is the future is sectoral approaches to trade um, where we can get some synergies and move towards those 21st century economic agenda and per perhaps not have the fights of decades on agriculture and things like that. But we'll have to see. I, I'm not optimistic about a future US-UK free trade agreement. Uh, and of course, Nancy Pelosi has already said there's going to be no dice when it comes to a free trade agreement. If in any way, shape or form, Good Friday, Belfast agreement is compromised, right? So, yeah, absolutely. And that was made clear well before uh, before the election. And that's a bipartisan perspective. Uh, you know, in some ways, uh, Nick Mulvaney, special envoy, said, said the same thing. Um, uh, but again, I just to touch on something that, that Katie had said earlier, and perhaps this is just me analytically, what, what shocked me so much about the internal market bill and then the taxation bill that, that would have been put forward is that the UK was willing to break international law in some ways, use this as a negotiating tactic, the Good Friday Peace Agreement, a negotiating tactic. What prevents that from happening in the future with either a future trade agreement where you have, I don't like elements of this, I'm going to break the law if I don't like elements of this. I think this has broken trust, at least for me, a little bit more fundamentally than I understood. So it wasn't just a negotiating or a leverage ploy to get today's agreement, hard fought agreement, to me, it was playing with something that never should have been played with. And I, I think that will underscore a, a, a level of distrust uh, in Congress in the future. Okay. Thanks, Heather. Anand, I have a question here that's for you. Um, it, it's gonna be a tough one, I'm promising you, okay? <laughs> if the Brexit vote were held again tomorrow, would the outcome be the same? That's uh, a I don't know. Uh, <laughs> let me just let me say where we're at and then see yeah. if we can come to a conclusion. Uh, we've had so YouGov do a monthly tracker poll where they ask, was it the right decision or the wrong decision to vote to leave the European Union? And they've done it every month since the referendum. And the last few months have seen the biggest lead for wrong decision that we've seen sort of systematically over the last few months. Uh, two things to be said about that. Firstly, actually, most of that change we think is made up of people who either didn't vote or couldn't vote in 2016. So either people who didn't bother to go and vote or people who were too young to vote who now say they'd vote remain. There's relatively little evidence of people changing their minds. Uh, the second thing worth saying is that uh, amongst those people who think it was the wrong decision, there are a significant number, I wouldn't like to hazard a guess. I mean, the, the figures for this come from a different set of polling, so I can't sort of combine them into one. But a number of people who think, even though it was the wrong decision, we need to act on it because we voted to do it in a referendum. So despite the fact you've got a majority now thinking it was the wrong decision, uh, I'm not certain how that would play out in a referendum. If you put a gun to my head, I would say it would possibly come out the other way, yes, it's conceivable, but it was far, far from certain, to be honest. Mm -hmm. 
Let me put that same question, but in a different light to, to Katie. And Katie, have opinions in Ireland and Northern Ireland changed vis-a-vis -vis Brexit in the past four years? That's one of our questions as well. Um, no, not, not really. I mean, you have seen a slight increase in those who say that they have a Remain identity compared to those who voted Remain. But again, it's that question of, you know, the difference between... You know, you do surveys of capturing people who didn't vote or wouldn't vote normally. Can I just say something, um, just picking up on the, the question of, you know, what um, Nancy Pelosi and Mick Mulvaney and others have said. Please. Yes. Yeah, I think it's a really important point, and that is, um, that I'm about to make, and that is that the protocol has changed everything. I, I really couldn't state it enough that when we're talking about the risk to the Good Friday Belfast Agreement now, you know, the, the prospect of a hard Irish border in the way that we were facing um, just over a year ago has, has really gone. I, I, a lot has to happen before that's back. Maybe it could possibly come back in, you know, after that democratic consent vote and that, that issue does, you know, raise its head again then in such a scenario. And that vote will be every four to eight years, by the way. But otherwise, we're not dealing with that prospect. What we're dealing with now is, is a much more complicated um, situation in which Northern Ireland's economy is going to have to readjust in some ways. It is going to um, be disrupted by what the protocol means for GB to NI trade. And this is worth bearing in mind that if we have a no deal, what it does mean is that as well as those customs procedures, goods that are GB goods coming into Northern Ireland will have to pay tariffs or many of them will have to pay tariffs because of that question of whether those goods will be at risk of using Northern Ireland as a backdoor into the EU. So this is a, this is what that um, you know the taxation bill and those you know what the UK government is threatening to do in relation to that. This is where this hits, and this is about that question of um, how how many goods would have tariffs paid on them to enter Northern Ireland. Now they could be they would be rebated and all of that. We don't know how yet, um, but this is a imagine that as a kind of you know, an existential shock to a very small region that's already feeling peripheral to uh, to GB um, and is, you know, obviously outside of the EU now. I think the challenges really should not be um, underestimated. And therefore, when we're saying, what is it to uphold the Good Friday Agreement in all its parts? What is it to keep an eye on the Good Friday Agreement vis-a-vis -vis US, UK, FTA? Things are much more complicated now. It's about um, something very distinct for Northern Ireland, the NHS comes into it, the agri-food industry being you know, under, undercut in GB, et cetera. All of that is, is, is what we need to bear in mind now when it comes to the US commitment to the Good Friday Belfast Agreement. It's, it's got much more complicated as a result of the protocol. Let me uh, ask Kevin a question uh, on that. You know, of course, if we, if we have the protocol in place, we're not gonna have the land border, but we are gonna have, as Katie was suggesting, the sea border. Does the sea border, you know, she said it's going to be complicating. Kevin, can you just lay out for a way the, the ways in which it will be complicating? But, uh, well, again, I mean, Kate, 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 Katie should really do that. But I mean, I mean, it is an extraordinary thing that the UK government is now going to do. It's going to administer systems that involve kind of all sorts of paperwork that's normally associated with international trade. Uh, and this is going to be trade within its borders. I mean, I mean, we shouldn't minimize that. Uh, I mean, I mean, I mean, from the Republic's point of view, you know, we 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 felt we had to do everything we could to avoid a land border because, you know, British decisions meant there was going to have to be a border somewhere. So we were going to be damned if it was going to be along our border with Northern Ireland. But I mean, you know, we have to be honest and say that this is an enormous ask for the UK state. And I, I, I think it's I think it's really something to be celebrated, actually, that both sides have reached that agreement today, because for the UK, I think it's extremely painful. And I, I, I gather, I mean, I haven't been following Twitter, but I gather there's already blowback uh, in London. Gove is being as accused of being a Remainer and all sorts of things. Bill Cash is angry and, and, and so forth. And you can kind of exp understand that, you know, but, but, but on the other hand, you know, it would, these were equally sensitive issues for, for the EU, uh, you know, because, I mean, the internal market is kind of the EU in a way. If you undercut the internal market, there isn't an EU anymore. Right. So, so, so both sides were facing extreme risks and they've managed to hammer out some sort of uh, a mutually acceptable compromise. I think that's that augurs well for the future. I, I'm going to be optimistic and, and choose to say that. Well, it's nice to hear some optimism here for a change as opposed to the pessimism that we started with. But uh, Heather, um, 
we have a question you may not be able to answer, but I'd love to hear your thoughts on it. If not the particulars, at least the sort of person that we'd have in mind. Uh, who will be President Biden's special envoy to Northern Ireland if he names one? Oh, that's a great question. I've seen there's definitely press speculation about the U.S. ambassador to Dublin, but really. Um, to, if you have any thoughts on that, please do share them. Well, only what I read in the newspaper, so it's it's no knowledge. I'm just sharing that uh, it looks like uh, former Senator Chris Dodd is certainly getting some some speculation. Again, I think this will be someone that has deep roots to the community and is a very close personal friend to to President Elect Biden. So I think that will be the choice. But in some ways, the I don't know the who, but it sort of pulls back to to what Katie was saying. And sort of, as you can hear my light motif in this conversation, we can't keep doing the way things have always been done because everything has changed. So a, new, a, a U.S. special envoy is going to have to understand what this, uh, a new U.S. commitment to the Good Friday Accords means in uh, knowing about the, the Northern Ireland Protocol and all of the challenges that Katie outlined and the reorientation of the Northern Ireland economy. Um, maybe it's not going to be much of, dis of a disturbance once we get through processes. Maybe it's going to be massively disruptive. We don't know the answer to that. So that, again, this gets back to if the U.S. wants to continue to play an important role in this, it is going to have, that special envoy isn't going to go back and forth. That special envoy is going to remain in place to understand, do a lot of work with both communities to appreciate these changes and then be able to be an honest broker, if it can, to London and Dublin to try to understand uh, what this all means and to signal when there is uh, tensions. And I think we can't under estimate the potential for a rise in tensions, how to address that very quickly. But this is a new ballgame. So I don't want someone who's a name that we all go, oh, isn't that a name? I want someone who's going to be a credible partner and is going to work this problem straightforward, in a straightforward way. All right, well, we're, we're nearly at our end. I want to throw something out to Anand just to finish us off here. And that is you, you started us out with a note of pessimism. As you've listened to the others here, even saying that maybe indeed we may not have a deal, but there's going to be some, some sort of a nice silver lining to some of these clouds. I was wondering if, if your views have changed at all, or how are you feeling? So my views is my character that we're talking about now, and no, my character <laughs> remains solidly pessimistic, I'm afraid. But uh, I mean, it's absolutely and incontrovertibly the, the case that the agreement today is a big deal yeah. for the island of Ireland. I mean, that is really, really good news. Uh, it, it lifts a whole cloud of uncertainty. The devil will lie in the details. And of course, the details aren't out yet in terms of the goods that are exempt from state aid provisions and what the nature of these checks are going to be. And there are going to be fights to come over that because, I mean, as Kevin was saying, already people are voicing dissatisfaction. I mean, it's, it's, it's been a curious year, hasn't it? Because you know, Boris Johnson signed up to a deal that everyone knew implied checks. He denied that it implied checks and some of his MPs decided to believe him rather than everyone else. Uh, we still, we're sort of, the British government has accepted whatever the EU has said. We wait to see what the EU says in the nature of the checks. I don't think the squabbling over this is over as yet, but I think it is a very, very important point in the process that we've got this agreement because at least it provides a degree of certainty for Northern Ireland now, whatever happens over the next week in the Brexit negotiations themselves. That's as close as I get to being chipper. We'll take it, we'll take right. it. I wanna thank all of our panelists, Anand, Katie, Kevin, Heather, thank you so much for a wonderful, wonderful discussion. I fear we were supposed to enlighten you. I fear that we may have confused you with all this talk of optimism, of pessimism, as we're thinking about principles and how these different groups are, are, are not being able to find any kind of common ground. We've talked a lot also about trust. And of course, even though things are fluid when it comes to understanding Brexit and its many implications, we're also, it's compounded also by the fact that we find ourselves at a watershed moment with COVID. So stay tuned. There are so many more things that are going to be uh, occurring as we, we inevitably turn the page. One thing is for certain is that Churchill was indeed right. Things may have changed. We may find ourselves on the other side of something once we all get vaccinated, but the steeples of Fermanagh and Tyrone will still be there. I want to thank everyone for joining us. And again, thank you all to our panelists. Be well. Thank you all. Bye. Nice to see you all. <laughs>